Thank you so much for that, Arvind. Um, wonderful. Yeah, we can see you. Hopefully you can see us. But um, I think that everything you've been saying taps into the same mission and ethos of starting life as a fan, understanding what it means to be a creative artist, and then deciding how to be a professional in the best way that works for your method and approach. And it's been fascinating to hear about your own trajectory and building up a varied career and your, your own creative process and your own wider portfolio. And I think what would be wonderful now, if okay, please, is if everybody present here, this is a perfect opportunity to ask some questions for Arvind about, yes, the processes of working in the creative industries and maybe even things like meeting a client's needs or how to build up your own portfolio. But this is, as you'll see, a mini taster of the kinds of things you can expect to see uh, as part of the learning experience on an MA of this kind. But yes, in terms of learning about the, um, the idea of building up a career in, in science fiction, whether it's writing for film, TV, comics, or games, or, or any other medium, you know, audio books, did anyone have any questions they wanted to ask for Arvind at all? Please do pop it into the um, question box. There's a li the little chat question box. Oh, oh, thanks. Um, Thank you, Elena. That's wonderful. Um, yes, don't have a question, but it's wonderful to hear about. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for coming. It's great. I mean, I think, um, Arvind, a, a key question is, what do you think is the most important thing to keep in mind when everybody sets themselves such high expectations? Everybody wants to be the, ma the major director, the major writer or producer, but it's more important to understand what your specific niche is within industry or even more to do with independent projects like creative projects how would you advise someone to begin their first steps from the fat from a fan to an artist to a producer to a professional um what what should they be looking out for and what's the best how do they get inspiration when it's those tough times when they feel like oh should i give it up what kind of strategies would you um, advise I think, I think a number of things. I think most people don't even know what all the jobs are. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but when I was starting out, I didn't know what a producer was. You sort of know what actors are because you see them on television. You sort of know what authors are because you see their names on the covers of books. But all the other jobs in between, producer, director, first assistant director, um, editor, agent, all these things are slightly mysterious to you, or even if you think you know what they mean, until you've actually talked to someone who's done the job or shadowed someone who's done the job or interned, uh, they are mysteries. So I would say, go and find out what all the jobs are, because there's no way of finding your niche unless you have some sense of what the niches are. And certainly that was true of me. When I started, I thought I wanted to be a director. I hate directing. I've done it a bit, but it's not the thing that makes me happy. But at in my teens and 20s, I thought that was the job to aim for. Um, turned out it was writing and producing, but even that was gradual. I discovered producing first. When I was directing, my producer said to me, you should do my job, you're good at it. And I had never considered it before. And so I tried it and it turned out I did enjoy it and I was good at it. But then it was years of producing full time before I realized that I was really missing the writing that I used to do as a student. And so I came back to the writing through my collaborations with David Baddiel, who I had been producing for a long time, and he suggested that I have the confidence to write my own work, and I'm forever grateful to him for that. Um, so find out the niches, that's one thing I would say. And the only way to really find them out is to do them. And as a student, you have this enormous privilege, is you can just go make stuff for almost no money. Most colleges, most schools will let you put on plays, will let you make student films, you can just sort of go do it. There's normally a lab somewhere, a building somewhere, a theater somewhere, grab some friends and just go make something. But do all the jobs. On the first Dirt Gently, I co-adapted it with my best friend then. I co-directed it with another friend. I played Dirt Gently. I helped design the sets. I helped find the costumes. Do all the jobs and then you'll figure out which ones make you happy. That's in terms of the jobs. I think the second thing is figuring out if you have a genre, if you have a particular set of thematic 
or stylistic preoccupations that will take you, you know, are you a sci-fi person? Are you a fantasy person? Are you a children's uh, literature? Are you adult? Are you literary? Are you film? Are you TV? I mean, there I would say my experience is follow the stuff you love and don't worry too much about labels. And this is contrary to what a lot of people will tell you. A lot of people will say you have to find your, your, your niche. You have to say, I'm a science fiction author. I am a children's novelist. But let me give you a couple of counter examples. Today, we probably think of J.M. Barry as the author of Peter Pan, and we don't think about him as much else. And we think of A.A. A. Milne as the creator of Winnie the Pooh, and we don't think about him as much else. They would both be horrified to know that was true. They would be spinning in their graves because before they created Peter Pan and Winnie the Pooh, they were celebrated, sophisticated, adult playwrights. They were the toast of the West End. They were grown up playwrights. That's what they wanted to be. Uh, and that's what they set out to do. But for reasons of, in their personal lives, they happened to each write a children's story that became the immortal thing. We don't get to choose. Um, Neil Gaiman said this very famously. We don't get to choose what we're remembered for. We're lucky if we get remembered for anything. And I think similarly, you should write the stuff you love. But what I will say is you should know the genres you're writing in. Um, I'm in the middle of writing a, sci a science fiction anthology series for uh, Audible. And, and I've written this, I, I wrote this thing earlier this year called The Neil Gaiman at the End of the Universe, which is a half hour drama short story that stars Neil Gaiman and Jewel Stay, and is a piece of sort of science fiction in its own right, but is also a sort of tribute to Neil Gaiman and his work. Now, I couldn't have written that if not for the fact that I've read everything Neil Gaiman's written several times, and not for the fact that I've written, uh, that I've read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of classic short stories from the golden age of science fiction, uh, Asimov, Clark, Bradbury, uh, and so on. And so having done that, I felt qualified and confident to have a go. Now, I'm not saying don't write anything till you've read everything, because that's just procrastination forever, but try and do them both at the same time always. Read and write, read and write, watch and make, watch and make, and bring your professionalism to both. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you, um, Arvind. I think the, the last point I'd like to make is from what you've been describing, storytelling seems to be at the heart of the process, both in dreaming up a project and following it through. And you could be a storyteller as a director, sure, but you can also be a storyteller in any other role. You have to have that passion and know exactly the story you want to tell. I think what, what's great is lots of other questions have come in, Adam. So I think we can um, ask Arvind some of these, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a good one here um, asking, do you, um, can one be successful by working with other books today? Or do you think um, you need to have your own original material? I feel like you've touched on that a bit already um, with the yeah, Neil yeah, Garman no, example. No, absolutely. Look, there are plenty, I think it depends what sort of creator you are, what sort of creative you are. They are people who have their own ideas constantly. And hmm. they should write those. Uh, Neil yeah. Gaiman is a good example. Neil Gaiman is not spending a lot of his time adapting other people's stories because no. he has a lot of stories of his own. I mean, famously, um, Neil, like me, got his start with Douglas Adams, who wrote a, oh, okay. um, a interview with Douglas Adams for, if I'm remembering correctly, for Penthouse magazine uh, in the early 80s. And that interview turned into a book-length sort of biography of Douglas Adams which was Neil's first published work and made him known as an author. And, you know, like me, Douglas was, uh, as he was to me, Douglas was generous uh, to Neil, and that's how his career started. Uh, and Douglas did ask Neil at one point if he would think about adapting uh, Hitchhikers uh, and uh, Gently for the Radio. And Neil declined because he was too busy doing his own work at the time, writing Sandman, and Dirk Maggs came along and did that. Anyway, what I'm, what I'm saying is there are people who endlessly create their own work, and they should do that. Yeah. And there are others who are amazing craftspeople 
of structure and um, and uh, understand the production demands of adapting something to film or theater or TV. And mm. well, you have your own preoccupations and your own themes, but you work best when you're bringing it to bear on a story that's already there. I put myself in that category most of the time. I occasionally have a wholly original idea. The series I'm writing now is wholly original. But most of the time, I'm reacting as a fan, as I've described today. Um, yeah. And there are lots of people who make very happy livings and careers doing, doing that. Um, uh, you know, other than me, think of J.J. Abrams, uh, who I'm also yeah. privileged to work with. J.J.'s made his career uh, going back to the stuff that he loved as a child, Star Wars, mm -hmm. Star Trek, and building those out bigger and better than before. Uh, but he's also created original stuff like Lost. Um, mm. So I think you can do either, is the honest truth. Now, obviously, if you're going out to get existing stuff, you need to do, you need to get rights. You need to persuade people to trust you with their work. Yeah. You need to pay them money. Uh, you need to write letters like I wrote by the servants. Um, that's great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and then another one here asking, um, says, thank you for the talk. Um, when you started out, did you have a, a money job at first, um, in inverted commas, or did you plunge 100% sort of right away into what you really wanted to do? Um, no, and do a, you see a, a conflict a, there, I suppose, would be an extra bit? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question, because the, the practicality of this is everything. Here's some, here's some hard truths. Um, do not do this if you're doing it to make money or to get rich. They are much, much, much easier ways. Do not do this to get famous. Do not do this to get laid. They are much, much easier ways to achieve all those things. The average income from writing of a published author in the UK is something like 22,000 pounds a year. It's a terrifyingly low number. Um, mm -hmm. The reality of the creative businesses is, is that they are lottery businesses. There's a tiny percentage who you have heard of who get rich and famous. And then mm -hmm. there is a small but sizable percentage who earn a living. And then there's everyone else who doesn't and never will. And sadly, that's probably 70 or 80% who doesn't and never will. And you need to kind of know that going in. And knowing that going in means, yes, you need to build other sources of income. You need to build out, if you are, if you are lucky, you can build those other sources of income in a way that's very consistent with your main career, which is to say there isn't a conflict. You can teach, you can write journalism, you can work uh, on other people's projects, you can build a purely and fully creative career, but not all of it will be your own personal creations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really worth thinking about. You know, and, and again, as students, you have a wonderful sort of illustration of this because You'll be familiar with, you know, one semester you're working on your friend Joe's play and he's written it and you're designing scenery. And next semester, it's you who's written the play and Joe's working on it, helping with costumes. And I think sort of that feeling of working on each other's stuff and some bits of it are paid and some bits of it are free and some bits of it are more passion and some bits of it are less passion. I think that's really worth thinking about. Um, the other way to do it is to do something that is totally different from your passion as, as the money job, as you put it. Um, I did that for a couple of years. I was a lawyer for a couple of years. Uh, for me, honestly, it was a little bit less about the money, although that was nice, and it was more that I didn't have a visa. Uh, I'm an immigrant, I'm a multiple immigrant. Uh, I was Malaysian before I was British, I was British before I was American, um, about to become Irish, keep the European in me somehow. <laughs> and um, as an immigrant, you normally need someone to sponsor your visa. And so I found a law firm to sponsor my visa, and I worked as a lawyer for two years. Uh, I did a deal with the firm, and I took off a month every summer to go direct a show. One year it was Dirk Gently, another year it was Arcadia. Um, and as soon as I had my visa, and as soon as I had enough money in the bank, I quit. And I built, and since I was 23 till now, I have pretty much always worked in the creative industries. But I have always found ways to do that hybrid thing, to you know, to this day, my producing probably makes me more money than my writing, um, but I spend about equal amounts of time doing both. And they both pay, but they pay in different ways. 
comics pay almost nothing, but I love them, so I keep writing them. Um, Broadway pays quite well. Film and TV depends on the size of the project and what job you're doing. Um, so I do a range of stuff. Yeah. And different bits pay for other bits. Even right now, I have two projects that I'm writing right now. One is very well paid. The other is a book of passion that I'm doing for fun. Um, but the one subsidizes the other. Uh, so, you know, think about that. The, the, the most honest thing said about this, there's a science fiction author called uh, Larry Niven, which if you haven't read, you should, the Ringworld series. And in the very first Ringworld book is a dedication, and Larry dedicates it to his grandfather. And what he says is, most writers have to work as a waiter or a waitress for the first 10 years of their career as they write at night or in the early morning making all their mistakes. He said, I was very lucky. When my grandfather died, he left me a trust fund, and that paid for the year of my life, in which I could make all the mistakes in one year. And so I never done anything <laughs> right professionally since. So there's that option too, but it involves having a rich grandfather. <laughs> um, and then I th we will we'll be moving on to the next portion um, um, of the webinar shortly. But there's just there's one question here from uh, one of our colleagues, academic colleagues here at Richmond, John Chua. And I'm not sure if this is um, yeah maybe maybe a, a, a sort of uh, a slight joke, but it says tell us about your first look deal with Warner and Bad Robot. Is there some inside uh, knowledge there that um, or? Uh, or not. So, no, that, that's, that, that's public knowledge. It's not a joke. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether all your students will want to know whether just John wants to know the answer to that question. But I'll try and make it, a, try and make it a general, of general interest to the group. There. Um, uh, if it's relevant, I, then yeah, please tell us. Otherwise, um, yeah. <laughs> well, as I say, one of the things about one of the joys of my life is is working with people who I am a fan of, and. Uh, I think it's really important as you start out to identify those people, authors, writers, directors, producers, and really get to know their work. Because if you think you want a career like them, then you need to really understand their career. Mm. Uh, and for me, one of the people for 20 years uh, has been J.J. Abrams. And I've always sort of said, oh, J.J.'s career, his mixture of genres, because he's known as a sci-fi guy, but he doesn't just do sci-fi. He first mm. came to prominence creating a series called Felicity, which was about, which was about a college student. It was about a college student girl living away from home for the first time, a very sort of slice of life, soapy uh, drama. It's wonderful. Um, his first movie was Regarding Henry, a domestic drama starring Harrison Ford and Annette Bening. Uh, but of course, he's known for all his sci-fi stuff. And the other thing about JJ is he works across all mediums, film, TV, theater, computer games, yeah. music. Uh, and he does all the jobs. He can. He writes music and composes it. He writes, he writes and directs. He can build sets. He's incredibly detailed in his knowledge of every aspect of the business, and he's a very good businessman. And he does good along the way. So I've always emulated and admired JJ. And so it was a one, but I never met him. Uh, uh, but it was a kind of joy about a year ago uh, when the person who runs his film business, Hannah Mangella, who's a dear friend, um, approached me and said, hey, do you want to come to the office and talk about a partnership? And yes, now I'm in partnership with Bad Robot and JJ Abrams, and we're making a bunch of things together, and we have a first look deal uh, that we share with them and, and Warner Brothers. And having a first look deal like, is, is a bit like having um, that grandfather who left you a bit of money. Having a first look deal gives you, as a company, uh, or as a writer or producer, gives you the overhead to sort of pay for your staff and your um, expenses as you dream up and write up the next thing. So it's a nice thing to have. Um, that's brilliant. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that, um, Arvind. Um, everyone, we're now going to move on to the um, to the sort of presentation about the MA Film Science Fiction and Fantasy that um, we'll be launching at Richmond this September. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to share my screen and um, yeah, and uh, then yeah, me and Caleb will, will take you through that. Um, I've been, I'm not sure, um, obviously. I, um, I, I, I think will, much as I would like to stay and hear the news, yeah. I have to do it with my family, so I will say thank you yeah. and goodbye, everyone, and have a great, have a great presentation. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, you so much, Arvind. Yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. Thanks. Um, yeah, okay. thanks. Right. Sorry, let me just um, do this now. One second, guys. Mm -mm -mm.
That's that's the presentation, isn't it, Caleb? That is it. Yes, thank you, Adam. Yeah, perfect. Okay. One. So, Great. so hi there, everybody. So we are um, launching this MA Science, MA Film, Science Fiction, Fiction and Fantasy this September. Um, it's a really, really specialist program. There's no other MA film like it in the UK. Um, and um, it has been uh, sort of designed to prepare you for a, for a career in, in a multitude of jobs in the industry. Um, Caleb. Thank you, um, Adam. Yes, so as you would have heard from Arvind, there's an important ethos and mission at the centre of um, this MA and what it can offer you. So if you think about any MA in filmmaking, broadly speaking, or a skill set in industry, it tends to, and I, I think it makes sense, focus on a specialism in depth throughout the year. Now, where, while that may have its benefits, what we do with this MA is a little different. We are indeed the only MA programme in the UK to offer a specialism in science fiction and fantasy industry in which you'll get both a UK and a US qualification. But more importantly, we use London as a resource. We use it as a learning laboratory. We use it as an opportunity for you to build up your contacts, go to production companies and make that CV stand out from the crowd. So this is really aiming to give you a unique preparation for a career in the industry. And when, if you're a fan in any sci-fi franchise or any kind of fantasy story, as you've heard from Arvind, you can move along this trajectory to turn from fan into a, a practitioner or a creative artist or writer, whatever your specialism is, and then into a professional. So these are just some of the examples that you could do. I mean, we will offer you all of the information you need and you will hear from guest speakers each week on the courses about their experiences, their expertise and build up your portfolio. But yes, certainly there is aiming towards directing, production, writing, visual effects artistry. We even have partnerships with Industrial Light and Magic and Lucasfilm. We often have lots of diversity talks with them, careers um, talks with them and workshops. And we were speaking with other companies like Disney Pinewood and NBC Universal to hear from their executives on the Sci-Fi Channel. And that's, we like to build bridges between academia and industry the campus and the real world, and certainly get a blend, not just of the theory, but how that theory feeds into practice. Although this is not certainly an, uh, a filmmaking intensive MA, it's an MA in which you will have plenty of opportunities to develop filmmaking skills, but learn important theoretical ideas about creative storytelling along the way. So it, the other uh, options available to you alongside editing um, and I think the uh, other options there were you know you've got advertising becoming an influencer or indeed um, maybe wanting to be a journalist or a critic or, or just a scholar who focuses on this and teaches this material and builds up your rep reputation in higher education and further education or you may want to get into publishing or be more hands-on and as a set technician we'll have you covered for all of these areas and it's up to you to tell us what you want and how you you want us to shape the MA in the way that works for you. Brilliant. So yeah, a little, little bit of a taster there, an insight into sort of you know the the, uh, the careers um, and possibilities from this from this MA degree. And just to give you a bit more information about Richmond, so we are a very small university. Uh, we have about 250 students at postgraduate level, and that's across about 10 different master's degrees. Um, we are a very uh, international university. We don't have any one nationality that dominates. Um, we are a real mix of sort of UK, European, US, and then other international sort of students. And that will be reflected in, a, or that is reflected in our class sizes. So average class on our MAs um, is between 15 and 20 students. And you'll probably be studying with 10 to 12 different nationalities within that. Um, as uh, Caleb has highlighted, we have academic act experts and then industry professionals that will um, contribute to your learning on these programs. We have a graduate employment rate of 93%. So this means within six months of uh, leaving university, 93% of our graduates have a full-time graduate job or are in further study. You're gonna be studying for a minimum of nine hours a week. Um, and you'll see how that breaks down in a, in a couple of slides. That's slightly higher than the UK average for master's programs. And you will have your own personal academic advisor. This is a full-time member of staff who will be your, um, yeah, your person to contact about um, academic uh, questions. Maybe they'll be your dissertation supervisor, and they'll be able to give you some advice on your internship as well. And then 
Last point there, as a Richmond graduate, you'll uh, join our alumni network. Um, so this is made up of, of 15,000 15, alums over 140 countries, um, and it's a great network and resource to become a part of, not only when you're a student, but then when you graduate and you're entering uh, the world of work. Um, and then, of course, we are based in London, so our a facility for our master students is in Kensington. It's this building you can see here. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a few slides. Um, it's right in the centre of London. It's a great place to be located. And then just to highlight that, um, you know, London is one of the two global centres uh, for film, TV, cinema. So you really want to be studying a programme of this nature in London. Um, and taking advantage of all the opportunities there are um, available and we do a lot of things outside the classroom to to complement what you will, what you will be studying inside the classroom thanks caleb thank you adam yes just a couple more um key points on what our program offers you that makes it so unique to becoming um becoming an expert in the aspect of science fiction and fantasy industry storytelling and, the, and fulfilling that passion as much as you, you wish to you will gain a detailed knowledge of industry practices and storytelling in whichever field you want to specialize in and you will be allowed to have a lot of freedom on the topics that you want to focus on both the research projects or making films or in building up contacts and a network and databases with industry professionals that have worked on the very franchises that you know and love and maybe you can be involved in working on those too and also as adam um, mentioned again academia and industry speak to each other always across the course the way in which we assess you will depend on you learning from actual experts that have their own portfolio of work in this genre and we want to enhance all of your employment opportunities not just with this background knowledge and you'll be developing your cv as you work your way through the program along the way uh, along each, uh, each course but there is the opportunity to have some internships at the kinds of companies that you've always wanted to work at and we can help you out with that from day one getting in touch with them what you'll need learning about the culture of the studio and the last main point is we are very much an international outlooking university we believe in global citizenship we believe in a, um, preparing you for the global marketplace but also a diversity a, di a diverse range of perspectives we don't just say look at western centric modes of science fiction fantasy we have research centers and connections to other universities and, and partners in uh, china to learn more about uh, science fiction in the far east uh, we learn about science fiction in the middle east and in africa as well as latin america and so, yeah, but clearly, if you want to go down the Hollywood and Anglo-American route, we'll certainly have you covered for that as well. And these are small class sizes, so you can build up a real um, cohort, uh, you know, a, a sense of a camaraderie and a collegiate relationship there. Yeah. And also just to talk about what to actually expect specifically in terms of the courses themselves, from september you will begin with the science fiction fantasy industry course that's very much along the lines with what you've heard today from arvind you'll be taken around to different sites in london different production companies different exhibitions you'll uh, this will be you'll be based from at like an hq if you like the kensington campus using the very best of london as a resource and each week say the first week you'll learn what, how to be a producer next week a director then an editor then a writer then an advertiser or whatever it is i think that you'll need to learn which uh, speaks to you and then accompanying this there's the digital storytelling course in which you learn all about not just the importance of visual effects work and um uh, being a digital effects art artist with ilm but also Digital technology is a way in which we distribute and consume these franchises and products. The conversation very much continues between films, between shows. If you have a Disney Plus subscription, I'm sure all of you will know that all of the conversation about what's going to happen with shows like Loki or WandaVision or uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier it continues online in different platforms. And so it's important to learn that cinema is very much it's evolving because of digital technology and science fiction fantasy is what it is today because of digital storytelling also the more academic experience will be with research methods you'll learn how to put together a coherent solid argument how to structure the research process which will prepare you for your final research project whether it's a dissertation or a film it's still very important to have those research skills um, 
In the spring, we continue with the storytelling theme by focusing on all the major genres of science fiction and fantasy in, in um, that module, um, sci-fi and fantasy storytelling. So yes, we've got um, things like magical realism in science fiction, post-apocalyptic worlds, as well as the big, bigger sci-fi things like, say, dystopian science fiction or superheroes or however you, whatever you want to focus on. Whether it's Game of Thrones or whether it's Star Wars, we can um, sort that out for you in terms of speaking to people who have written comics for these franchises and books, speaking to people who have created video games and worked on films for these franchises. We've got links to people that have worked in Star Wars and links to people that have worked in, in Marvel, so that's really great. The Edutainment Video Essays course is your opportunity to really get your filmmaking, hands-on filmmaking skills together. You will need to not just put together in a way that flows seamlessly with the editing and the co and you'll need to use those composition skills as well. How do you entertain someone at the same time as educate them? You'll need to create a compelling argument about a franchise that you want to better explore and put it up on YouTube, put it up on Vimeo, get your profile out there make people realize that you have a voice and you're an expert in this area and companies will pick up on it. And so you'll be um, fulfilling the knowledge of science fiction in both an academic and a professional capacity there because any production company or media company would expect you to have some good knowledge of how to put together a compelling piece of work in terms of filmmaking and editing. So, yeah, And visual cultures, that is more of, again, towards the academic end of the spectrum, learning about um, culture, history, politics behind the industry, art movements, the aesthetics of these of these products, and giving your giving the opportunity to really peel apart the layers, the interpretive layers of a film or TV show that you want to better explore. And uh, to close off the course, you'll have the opportunity to either really focus on an extended research project, a longer um, dissertation, or you could have a, a shorter thesis project. Uh, with an internship, as mentioned before, working along a company. And that smaller project, whether it's a film or, or, or a um, piece of writing, will allow you to say, this is the culture of the place I'm working at. These are their values. This is how they do things. These are the kinds of stories they provide. This is what they contribute to science fiction as a cultural phenomenon. So yeah, this is essentially what you'll be experiencing across the course. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Caleb. So guys, just to highlight that you have um, each week or in the first semester, you'd be doing so just under three hours for each class. So that's nine hours a week of face-to-face um, -face teaching. And that would be scheduled over two or three days. And it's usually in the hours of, of nine to five. Um, so just to give you a bit, bit of an idea of, of the timetable. Um, sorry, Caleb. Yeah. Faculty. Uh, just very, very briefly, we have a large um, a number of um, experts in industry uh, on our faculty, but these are just some examples, myself and um, Nicola, of more academic leaning um, members of faculty. So uh, I'll, I'll specialise on the film side, Nicola will specialise on the communications and visual culture side, and you'll see that this is very much an interdisciplinary experience. But the faculty is always there to help you, um, both in an academic and in a vocational um, sense, for sure. Thanks. For, oh yes, very briefly, we do have links, to, for instance, although we have lots of um, um, experts that have got have been awarded like British Fantasy Awards, the Arthur C. Clarke Awards, you know, they've got 20 years of writing under their belt and in so many different mediums. We do have links to academic institutions. This is the oldest science fiction research association in the world, and you'll automatically become a member of their massive archive, which will help out with essays, but also in your creative work as well. And it isn't just, say, professors um, or researchers. It's also editors, publishers, and other people in the industry that are related, that are connected to this association. And if we just jump to the next um, slide, please, Adam. There is Richmond's own research center, the Visual Arts and Cultures Center, this will be your opportunity to hear from, again, more academics, more industry experts, but also to present your own work and put it on the CV that you are a good communicator and you can field questions. And it gives you the confidence for being in those situations in the future. But yes, we are very all inclusive here. All aspects of media, culture, film, history, television, whatever it is, we'll explore it together. And um, there are plenty of networking opportunities as part of that. 
And guys, this is one of the real advantages of studying at a small university like Richmond, is that you will be able to do this collaborative research with professors and um, yeah, with wider sort of colleagues and, and people within our network in the industry. And you probably won't find that at larger, more, uh, larger institutions. Um, the internships that we talked about um, on the um, in the program structure here. So for all of our students, you will have the option to do an internship during your during the summer, what we call the summer semester. So teaching will finish in May, and then you are you will still be a Richmond student, and you will still have access to all our facilities, and you'll be having weekly or bi-weekly meetings with your um, professor, uh, uh, with your supervisor for your research project or for doing your film, but you would also do the internship during this time. And what makes our internship so special is that they are for credit, so they are part of your degree program. So if you do the, um, the project without the internship, you have to do a longer project to make up these, uh, these credits. And um, we will, our internships office will work with you on a one-to-one -one basis to find you uh, an internship in the area or with the type of company that you want to work, work with. Um, I cannot give you any concrete examples here because this is a, a new program that we, uh, uh, because this is, this is a new program, but Caleb will just highlight a couple of, the, of, uh, of places where students um, that study our bachelors in film have gone. And I also believe that, um, we, there is an internship um, opportunity available with Arvind as well. Um, so that, that is one, uh, one place that uh, we would like to send a student to. Um, if that, um, yeah, abs if, that, if it's absolutely. Yeah. So, so true, Adam. I mean, it, it's building up all the time. I mean, actually, we've just got another instructor on the industry course who's got lots of industry connections as well around the um, London Sci-Fi Festival. It's the biggest science fiction festival in the capital, probably in the whole country. And those have ties to, again, global, Europe and China and America. And also, I've been speaking to Disney Pinewood. I've been speaking to Lucasfilm. We once had the president of Sony come and give insights yeah. about what he would expect for internships. And I think that, you know, we have had students work on things like Black Widow, where we've had students work, say, on the advertising side and uh, for other franchises. Uh, we will help you build up that network by being on the doorstep of London. The sky's the limit. There really are so many opportunities out there. Yeah. yeah. And, and guys, that's really the key point. You know, there, there are so many different organisations that you could do your four credit internship with, and we will we will make that, that happen for you. Um, and then just moving on to some of the more practical details. Um, so... To apply for this program, we have a direct application form on the website and you will need to submit this along with copies of the supporting documents you can see here. So a personal statement, CV, your bachelor's degree and the lowest grade we're accepting for entry is um, what we call a 2-2 here in the UK. Um, so that's a second class degree. Um, in the US, that would be a uh, minimum GPA of sorry, 2.7, um, or the international equivalent. If you're not sure what your degree translate to, translates to, please just send me a message and I'll let you, and I'll let you know. Um, roughly, you'll need a minimum of sort of 65% in your degree to meet our requirements. Um, and then for those of you that don't speak English as a first language, we will need some proof of your English language ability. And once you send us these documents, you will then be invited to have an interview with Caleb. Um, as you can see, um, the tuition fees down here, sorry, there's been a bit of a formatting mistake here. UK students, the fees are £9,000. Um, and then for all other students, they are £13,250. So those of you from the US, EU countries um, and other international markets, it's £13,250. But we do have some um, scholarships to help reduce those costs. So for um, European students on here, we have this really special scholarship for this year. Um, it's £4,250, um, and that's just by uh, meeting the university's entry requirements. So once you have applied and been accepted, we will automatically award you this scholarship. And then for students from the UK, US, um, and other international markets, you can receive a 20% or a 15% discount based on your bachelor's degree. And you can see the grey boundaries there. So those of you with a, the equivalent of a UK first, you can receive a 20% discount. 
And if you have a UK 2-1, it would be a 15% um, a discount. And again, if you're not sure of those boundaries, please send us a message, tell me your results and where your degree's from, and I'll tell you which uh, scholarship you will qualify. Again, there's no application forms for these. These are automatic awards once your place is confirmed. And then we, we will, um, we're going to have a Q&A session now, but I just wanted to highlight that all universities in the UK are preparing for face-to-face -face teaching to start in September. The government is supporting us to do this, and we have lots of sort of um, safety measures in place um, to make sure that the campus is COVID secure and that we will have sort of normal interactive teaching from September. Obviously, this is a changing situation or this situation might change and we do have contingency plans in place and we will keep you updated of those um, over the next couple of months. But yeah, all teaching is expected to be face to face um, in September. Um, contact details on there of um, Caleb, so uh, Tennessee, and then um, if you email inquiries, that will come through to me and I will get back to you. And um, um, just a quick point, Adam, please do get in touch with me, everyone. Turn us see at richmond.ac.uk. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have at all. We could even have a quick chat on Zoom. But yeah, I'm very much yeah. I'm looking forward to having a chat with people about this to see what they think about the programme. Yeah. yeah. Guys, um, I know we're, um, we're sort of nearly at, at, at sort of full time as such. But if you, me and Caleb are happy to stay on for those of you that have time and answer any questions that you have. Um, about about the program, about applying, um, yeah, sort of student life in London, anything at all, please feel free to ask us. You can either type those in the chat box, or if you like, you can unmute yourself um, and just speak verbally. You might have to click on the red microphone to unmute yourself, but you should have the power to, to do this. And so obviously, guys, we are we are here to answer any questions you have. Um, if you don't, you can also follow us on social media. We've got um, there's some really great stuff on Instagram in particular at the moment from students that they, they posted just before they they left us at the last month to go to, to return home for the summer. Guys, um, please do type in any questions you have. Yes, if there's any um, point that you want me to reiterate or you feel like we haven't covered in enough depth or maybe mm. just to cover again, absolutely, this is a perfect opportunity to explore those um, uh, ideas together. But the whole, I think the emphasis um, that the importance of this MA um, to you is honing your vocational skill sets, raising your awareness of what's required to stand out from the crowd in industry, but also giving you the opportunity to turn a love and a passion of all things sci-fi and fantasy into a career. And as Arvin said, it can be quite unpredictable. It, it, can, it, it can be unexpected how that will unfold and evolve, but you will get there in the end. You keep chipping away and molding your career into what you want it to be. And this is the um, Sci-Fi MA is going to be the perfect opportunity, the first step towards doing that and achieving your uh, career goals. Um, great. Um, we've had a question here, Caleb, asking, um, do we need to have anything project or screenplay prepared for the program or do we do we just start from scratch should you do not need anything prepared at all um megan but if you like to prepare something then that's great too because we can develop it together i think that when you will start to be assessed on as you say creating um projects like screenplays and you're speaking with our experts and they tell you how they do it and they give you the different methods, then it will be inevitably give you the confidence to develop something from scratch or an existing screenplay or project. We are very open minded, but no, you do not need to have anything prepared in advance, but it can help to have some background knowledge of how it works in industry for you to then continue developing that, always thinking about it all the time. And we can help you to really hone those skills. Yeah. And, and equally on the back of that, you know, if you do have a portfolio of work or anything that you would like to um, to submit along with your application, please do so. It's not required, but it will help Caleb kind of just to understand exactly um, sort of where you're coming from, your motivations for the programme 
Um, and so, yeah, we, we find that really useful to learn a little bit more about you. Yeah. So if you do have stuff like that, please do send it in, but it's not, um, it's not compulsory. Yeah. Yeah, good, quite, good question, Megan. And um, guys, Thank another you, sort of key point here, just around um, sort of deadlines. Um, we ideally, you know, it's it's um, it's getting sort of close. The program won't start until the the end of September, um, but obviously um, there's usually a couple of weeks of admin that needs to happen um, before that. So it is good to apply. Um, as soon as possible, really. And certainly for those of you, I know there's a couple of you on it here that are uh, what we would call international students, and you will need a visa to study in the UK. Um, and this process can sort of take two to three weeks, depending on where you are in the world. So um, yeah, I'd really recommend sort of um, applying in the next week if you are interested in joining the program this September. And even if you don't have sort of all your documents, if you sort of let us know or just submit the application form, that gives us an indication and then you can spend, you know, a few more days um, or weeks gathering together, um, yeah, all the materials that, that are listed here. Um, if if every if anyone wanted to have an informal quick Zoom chat in, uh, you know, yeah. in over the next few days or, or in advance of a more formal interview, I could completely be available to that. That happens a lot and it can be a very useful process. But we don't, the first time we meet on Zoom doesn't just have to be with the formal interview, it can be a more informal version in advance if you'd like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, great, thanks Caleb. Guys, are there any other questions? Um, obviously if there's nothing else coming in, then we will look to, to end in the next sort of, yeah, yeah two, three minutes. Um, but as I said, we're more than happy to to stay on and answer any questions you have and um, if anyone wants to stay and stay and have a one-to-one -one conversation we could we can do that as well and um, also um there's if there's any other uh, events coming up i can get in touch with you and say when it's happening with more guest lecturers and uh, industry speakers mm -hmm. later this month and uh, as they become available we'll let you know so yeah keeping you involved in the in the research network yeah. Yeah, I'll just put in um, a quick link, actually. Um, oh, yeah, a link to the to the main site. Yeah, just to, just to over. Um, There's a couple of buttons at the top of the web page, everyone, that you can click on one of them, you get in touch with me, or you sign up for the next coming upcoming webinar. So, yeah, that's definitely the place to head to. Mm -hmm. And it's got all the information you need to begin thinking about the what how to um, the program can work for you and how to get the best out of it. But I think, um, yes. Uh, did you did you have access to it at all, Adam? The, the, so I'm just putting in a um, just putting a link just to give you an idea of some of the events that we've done at, um, through IBAC and through the research awesome. centres. Yeah. Excellent. Fantastic. Guys, if there are no other questions, then we will um yeah, then we we'll look to end in, in, in a moment. And um, please do though, we are uh, yeah, please do ask ask anything. Um, and the contact details are on there. So yeah, if you think of anything later today or tomorrow, please, uh, yeah, please just drop us an email, and um, we, we'll, we'll get back to you straight away. Definitely, yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thank you. Um, it doesn't look like there's any other questions coming in. Thank you for your time today. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed um, the talk from from Arvind and the information about the program. Yeah. Um, yes, um, you can expect to see a lot more of those kinds of um, dynamic um, talks in the across the program, and depending on the specialism. Yeah. yeah. So lots to look forward to. So that's brilliant. Um, thank you all, everybody, and um, yeah, have a lovely um, afternoon wherever you are in the world. And um, yeah, we will be in touch uh, with copies of the presentation and with some more information um, later today.
Thank you. Great stuff. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, bye, bye. 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 I think people are heading off now. Yeah, I'm just looking to see. We've got um, a couple still heading off. Yeah. Almost. Um, oh, another joined actually. <laughs> yeah, this Jacob. Let's just speak to him. I wonder, well, it's because it's British summertime, isn't it? So it's a bit confusing sometimes. Everyone's like, oh, London, GMT. And then actually we're not on oh, no. <laughs> So I'm worried yeah, he's well, going to be... It, at least Hi, it's Jacob. recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Jacob. Um, can you can you hear us? I can see that you've just joined. Um, so can you unclick your microphone? You might just be able to, to speak to us. Um, I'm afraid we're just finishing, Jacob. Um, we started at 12.30, which is actually um, not quite GMT. It's British summertime at the moment. But if you would like to just have a chat with us, then um, then we'll, we can happily do that now. Just have an informal chat for, for 10 minutes or so. Jacob, you also have this chat. Um, or questions box or chat box on the screen. No, Jacob, I can't hear you, unfortunately. Do you want to just try once more? Oh, there we go. Oh, it, the, I think, um, ah, yeah, there yeah. we are. Jacob, if you say something, we should be able to hear you now. Hello. Hi. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Hi. Hi. Um, Hi. Hi there. So yeah, we, we're just finishing, um, but obviously we're happy to stay and chat to you. Um, well, chat with you for a little bit. Um, so yeah, we actually started at twelve thirty um, UK time, uh, which is we're in British summer time, so it's a little bit later. Um, I'm not sure where you are in the world. London. You're I, okay. You're just in London. Fine. Um, um, yeah. I think um, so. What's really good, Jacob, is we've recorded this entire talk, so we can get that um, over to you, um, and you can check it out. But also, there's the website to look through too. But essentially, what we covered today was we heard from one of our visiting lecturers, Arvind, who told us about his experience working on directing science fiction, writing fantasy television and films, and you know, working with J.J. Abrams and these big names and working on Netflix shows. And it was what was the takeaway from that is that you can begin life as a fan and then you can become a creative artist and then a professional on top of that. But the not to feel frustrated if it doesn't happen too quickly to find your niche in the market, to find what your the specialism that you're most interested in is. And the, and the M.A. very much will have a lot of these talks across all of the courses and it'll give you an opportunity not just to listen to the academic perspective of science fiction but also industry professionals practitioners that actually have created products and work on franchises in and around the industry and london and we assess our assessments operate in such a way that you can build up a portfolio make your cv stand out from the crowd but we give you all of the options and you really need to choose what the specialism is that you want to focus on um, will be so if we say spend one week looking at producing another directing then editing writing and then telling you how to create stories for not just films and tv but games comics or even in things like advertising and social media really it's it's open it's open to you to hear what we can offer and to to develop and shape the ma in the way that suits your needs but really what i could do jacob is if you wanted to we could set up an informal interview on Zoom, or maybe you could send me lots of questions by email, and we could have a chat more about the MA. And then if you're interested, you could um, have more of a formal um, interview where I can ask you other questions about um, the MA. But I think what's important is, if you're interested in science fiction and fantasy and all forms of storytelling, and you want to turn this into a vocation that, can, that, you, know, that you can continue to build up as a profession, this is the only MA in the UK that can yeah. offer you the opportunity to do that using London as a learning laboratory and a resource. And it's also, you get the UK and US qualification. 
and mm -hmm. um, this that's what makes it so unique in preparing you for a career in industry. Jacob, is that what's your background? Is your bachelor's yeah, degree in films? in film as well are you a is there a particular area you're looking to sort of work in or want to work in yeah i'm trying to be a screenwriter so i'm probably going to do yeah okay a degree in creative okay. writing okay okay yeah so yeah. just Fantastic. to give you sort of yeah. sorry caleb you said yeah just going to quickly mention adam that you know we have uh, on as part of our teaching team screenwriters and novelists that have say Arthur C. Clarke Awards, British Fantasy, Science Fiction Fantasy Awards and they've spent 20 years writing not just books but also for film and TV and comics and games and as part of yes one of, this, the, um, one of those courses science fiction fantasy storytelling we really do emphasize all of the major genres and ask you to choose the one you want to become a, a specialist in and you'll speak to our experts to create your own screenplay and build up your body of work and portfolio so we have so the cohort will have people that want to be directors editors they want to be academics they want to be involved in advertising but it's a real it's a mix of different interests but if you want to focus on screenwriting we can take you along the path you need to and also thinking about those internship options as well you know we've got connections to lucasfilm and ilm disney pinewood We've had the president of Sony come along and speak to us about what he expects from interns working in, in his company. Uh, and yeah, so NBC Universal with sci-fi channel executives telling us about what they expect to see in a screenplay or for a producer. We're very much trying to build a bridge from the campus to industry, not just about, you know, academia is important, but it's more about the real world, the vocational skill sets, how do you um, create a CV that's translatable to what an employer would expect to see? So yeah, we'll definitely have all the bases covered for you there. Yeah. Okay. And this the way it's the way it's structured. So each class you see here is approximately sort of three hours, um, and so you would do sort of nine hours a week of face-to-face -face teaching time. That's on taught on campus in Kensington over two or three days. Um, so you would do that some full semester, spring semester, and then in May, the teaching sort of finishes, but you're obviously still a student, you'll still be working on your, your research project, which will probably be yeah, writing a, some sort of screenplay um, for, for you. Um, and then you would also do an internship as well. And what makes these internships really special is that they're, they're four credits and they're part of the degree program. If you choose not to do internship, you generally have to write an extra 5,000 words. On your on your project um, and that internship would be for six weeks and we would obviously look to place you you would have consultations with our internships office but you know for you who sort of has a goal in mind we would look to to give you an internship with a with a i don't know what the right word is caleb with an organization that does sort of screenwriting in in some way well, you know, if, if it's at the mainstream end of the spectrum or at the more kind of creative industries, smaller budget, mm -hmm. like, you know, like exhibition side, where, wherever you want to go along that um, arc. Yeah, I mean, we have ties to writers who have created work for Marvel and DC and Star Wars, but also mm -hmm. we have people that are documentarians and write about science fiction cultures, you know, like things like Comic Con and, um, that, and uh, online communities. So yeah, you'll begin to realize there's a whole terrain out there. There's a whole cut that you can map your own ideas onto and, to, to, and you'll find your specialism. Do you have yeah, any okay. questions about sort of that bit and the makeup? Uh, no, it seems pretty straightforward actually. Yeah. Cool. And then just to give you a bit more sort of general information about about Richmond. So we're also a member of this um, yeah, Science Fiction and Research Association. I'm sorry, Caleb. You, yeah. yeah, no, certainly. It's um, you see, we, we you know, we do like to emphasize the importance of industry practices and storytelling. But if you for writing, say, about the history of science fiction, the cultural significance, that more academic component, we have a partnership that you'll automatically become a member of the oldest um, science fiction research association in the world and they have a massive archive of all their journals and articles but it isn't just academics and teachers and professors that are a part of this um, network it's also people in industry like um, editors and publishers too so that could be very useful as a screenwriter because we also 
value the importance of getting into publishing and working with, as within a publisher's um, uh, off, uh, department. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we also have our own, um, what we call sort of research centre. Um, yeah, which uh, which yeah, organises its own events, and it's a forum for collaboration between students and academics, and then the the wider industry. Yes, it's good to have that on the CV actually. To if you create a piece of work and you can present it to an audience and field questions, that's invaluable experience for the future as well. Like in creative pitching, like trying to pitch your screenplay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if you have a look on the website, Jacob, you'll see some of the events um, yeah, that we did in spring from January to May. There's, there's a good list of sort of different alert, um, events and um, yeah, talks that we've had um, through the centre. Um, yeah, I mentioned a little bit about how the internships work. Um, and then just sort of some more general practical information. Uh, so as with most MAs here in the UK, um, we have a direct online form. You would just apply complete this form and then send us copies of your bachelor's degree, a CV, personal statement. Um, you're obviously from the UK, so you don't need to submit an English language certificate. Um, and then generally, once we have this, we'll just invite you to have a sort of slightly formal interview with Caleb. And it's just really to make sure you're the right fit for the for the program. Um, and um, then, yeah, and then, yeah, make sorry. it work for you. What, sorry, Adam, just to add, it, that's really an opportunity so you know exactly how you can make the program work for you, because what you'll prefer on it and what you won't prefer, and I can highlight that, yeah. Yeah, um, and you, you, um, you would need a minimum of 2-2 in your bachelor's degree, which I'm, which I'm sure you have. Um, and then in terms of tuition fees, um, for you, it'd be £9,000. Um, we have some really good scholarships, so I'm not sure what grade you've got if you're, if you know your final grade in your bachelor's degree yet. But if you have a 2-1, uh, you can get, sorry, what do you get? But we don't know yet. You, you're not sure, okay. But yeah, if 15% um, discount if you have a 2-1, 20% discount or a reduction in tuition fees if you have a, if you get a first. Um, so that 9,000 pounds could decrease by, yeah, nearly nearly 2,000 pounds if you have the first. Um, and you'll also be able to use the, um, to help fund your studies, the master's loan from Student Finance England. So they, a bit like the bachelor's degree loan, they can give you up to it's just over eleven thousand pounds to use towards your studies if you if you want or if you need to. Okay. Um, I don't have the Kensington slide here, do I? Where's Kensington? Oh, it's here. Sorry. And then Jake could just. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, and then I suppose just to highlight that all students at Richmond, they graduate with the UK and US degrees. So if you did want to go and live and work in the US at some point, then that um, that having a US degree can make it a lot easier. Um, we also There's also the potential to do an internship abroad as well. If you did, um, if you've got a connection with the US or particularly wanted to go to the US, um, we do sometimes manage to organise um, internships overseas. We're a really small university. Um, so we only have about 1,500 students, and most of those are bachelor's degree students based in, in Richmond, in southwest London. But um, the master's students, so you would be based in this building you can see here, which is in Kensington. It's just on Kensington High Street, so right in the heart of, of West London. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, in a nutshell, that's there. Yeah, that's kind of it. That's all the general, general overview. Um, and, and yeah, just to just to um, um, point out again, Jacob, that my email right there, um, turnusc at richmond.ac.uk. Please, um, you know, drop me a line on anything at all, and I can get back any inf info you need. And if you wanted to have um, that Zoom, then I'm available to do that as well in the next couple of days or next week or so, whenever suits you okay. suits you best. I'll definitely email you. Sounds good. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, no problem, Jacob. Thank thanks you. very much for today. Um, I'll send you through a copy of this. And um, yeah, please do get in touch with any other questions you've got. Okay, yeah, thank you. Sorry for being late. It's I no, 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 use. not at all, not at all. No, it's great to just to have yeah, you join us. Yeah. Um, great stuff, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 cool. Okay, cheers, guys. Um, take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye. So, um, um, Adam, I might uh, hang around and just have a quick two second chat with you. Yeah, 
were some ideas that came to mind. I think yeah. we're clear. Yeah, no, I've just dismissed him. So we did, we got up to about 10. Um, and um, I certainly saw a few the, people that yeah. I'd spoken to. I also had Great. two people email me, sorry, and say that they um, they were having trouble logging on. So that's positive. And obviously one of those people oh. is John Twar, who's a Richmond student, a Richmond professor or former Richmond <laughs> I saw professor. that, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, um, well, uh, that's interesting. I saw someone kept leaving and coming back in again, and I think that was probably just an internet issue. I mean, how many people wanted to come in but didn't get to come in in the end? Did, was there a couple? So I, I had two people email me saying they can't access, and I, um, yeah, Natalie Multi, um, and that I think she was trying to do it on a phone. And I just don't think it works <laughs> particularly. I think no. that's partly the issue. Zoom, Zoom has some functionality, but I don't on the phone. But I think it's it's um, tricky. Um, Adam, I'd ask. Really, yeah, yeah. Um, so those two, you know, that's that's not so much mm. an issue. But yeah, so what mm. if we say we got ten out of thirty? That's not that bad. That's... But yeah, I was hoping for a couple more. Um, I, I think what I was, what came to mind to me is that would we be able to get a list of all the people that definitely turned up today, um, yeah. and I can drop them another line directly. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe tomorrow is better than straight away today, but I could do that just to say, listen, hope you enjoyed the um, the webinar. If you would like to have a Zoom chat with me, please do, or just to drop me an email. And also the on top of those names that came in today, the people that tried to log in but couldn't couldn't follow through because of yeah. whatever technical issue. No, that's fine. So that list, I'll send you through the list of everyone who was registered, and then there'll be a column saying who actually attended or right. who didn't, and Excellent. then you can divide that up. Um, but yeah, why don't you send that email tomorrow? Because what I'll do this afternoon is I will literally just send through the people that attended a copy of this presentation and just say. Excellent. Thank you for joining us yeah. today. So then if you just send a shorter, yeah, personal, please let me know if you'd like a meeting. Um, um, and that would, could, yeah. I was just mm. I don't know whether you want to do that in two batches. So send one to the attendees and then the non-attendees, you could say I'll, I'll write what I was gonna, or that would be right great, here, thanks. Yeah. Um the other thing I was gonna say is it would it be possible for the non-attendees that did sign up, we can send them this recording. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, if we could do that though, ASAP, because if they got it, maybe I'd probably, yeah, you know, can't be done this week, I don't think. But if they did get it next week, then that would be ideal. Yeah. Okay, cool. I will, yeah. Yes. No, I can do that now. Do you want me, does he want me to delete the, his presentation a bit then? I think that the part, We'd better send him an email, but I think the thing he would definitely want to be deleted is probably when he was showing all the slides, because he mentioned it was something to do with it was a charity lecture he gave and they own the yeah. rights to it. But what we could do is edit that out in the best way. It's probably not a bad idea because it's short and sweet then because people have such a short attention span. But he did talk for a long time about what you need to do to get into industry. He fielded those questions in depth. So maybe if we cut out anything to do with the PowerPoint, and um yeah yeah but we could put a bit of context into the email and say he was talking about this 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 and this these q and a's are the follow-up to that yeah no no that's that's cool what i'll do then i'll i'll do that bit now send you through the recording and then um do you mind sort of prepping just that initial bit just that linkage bit that you just mentioned yeah 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 and then I can send it through, and then I'll send it to the non attendees Great. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. No, no, that's perfect. Um, yeah, let's do all that, and then I think on yeah, then we'll see what on Monday or Tuesday we can have another look. Mm. So I think next week would be a really it'd be good to have another little push, just with these yes, people um, and with anyone else that's come in. Um, I totally agree. Because this is yeah. the time when people are suddenly thinking, oh, God, I need to do something. I need to put my papers in, my application papers, before the summer's over. 
Yeah, no, this is this is really fun. Um, and then also, I'm just I'm off the week of the 19th, and then it's basically August, uh, I, and then it starts I coming quite late. I'm I'm the same, and my line yeah. manager is as well. And it so <laughs> happens it's Freedom Day, so on Freedom Day the world closes. So that's why we need to move quite swiftly, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess because Nicola's off that week as well, so she mentioned to me yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. Um, okay. I've, yeah, God, I keep forgetting it's that wasn't my intention at all to take off the week of freedom day, but yeah, it's just, it just happens to be like that. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, fine, kind of. Yeah, I'm going to do get on that now, and I'll I'll send you through the the list over email and the video. Thank you so much, Adam. That's fantastic, Christopher. And no I think we're really well today. Yeah, no, he was well. He's so interesting. Like, it helps. I don't yeah. didn't really know anything about him, so everything I'm like, oh, but yeah, yeah. yeah he spoke really well. Yeah. It, it was awesome, wasn't it? Talking about yeah. JJ Brims, I think that whole, held a lot of weight to it, which is great. Well, in that, and I, yeah. It's, yeah, it amazes me that you know back in the day that happened. You know, it almost seems too <laughs> like unbelievable yeah. nowadays. You just wrote to him and then said, "I'm doing this play." He wrote back. You did it, and then he came to see it. Like that's amazing. But weirdly, it's it's almost like the perfect story to sell the MA because that's what how we want everyone to be thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank, thanks, Caleb, yeah. and I'll, yeah, I'll be in touch okay. with Rima. Thanks. Bye -bye. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Bye. Bye.